Well, do open your Bible or use the printout of the passage that you have in the bulletin for this evening. We're going through the book of Acts on these Sunday evenings, and we have arrived at the second part of a great sermon that Peter has preached on the day of Pentecost. You will know that on that day there were a number of supernatural events that took place that were public events. That is, there were people there who noticed them, who observed them, uh, who were participants in them, who themselves did not experience the primary, the primary events um, that occurred. There was a, a mighty rushing wind. There was uh, the sound of thunder. There were many languages spoken in different dialects to the people who were gathered in Jerusalem. And this got the attention, obviously got the attention of the crowds that were pouring in to the city of God, that Pentecost. And in response to their questioning and, and also the criticism of some of the crowd, Peter is now giving an explanation. He begins in verse 14 by uh, talking about the, the Bible. He, he quotes from the Old Testament prophecies. He says, these prophecies have been fulfilled. These things that they've seen are a demonstration that God has heard the cry of Moses, that all of God's people should be able to speak the Word of God. And, and he's saying, you heard them. These are, these are ordinary people. They're, they're not linguists, but they've been talking in your language. They've been talking about the things of God. You've been hearing these things, in, not only in your language, but in the particular dialect of the area that you're from. Isn't that a remarkable thing? Some of these are Galileans. Galileans, they, they don't they don't speak multiple languages, but here they are speaking to you in your language and dialect the things of God. It was an amazing thing to happen. And this is what Joel was talking about, he says. Joel says that when that happens, it's the end time. The day of the Lord is at hand. Now, you'll imagine that if the day of the Lord comes, that's going to mean judgment. And yes, it does mean judgment. But here's the good news. The good news is that there is an escape from judgment. It's available to you. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved from that judgment that is coming. That's the good news. The question is, who is the Lord that I need to call upon if I'm going to be saved from the judgment? And so what Peter does in this next little section is he clarifies who this Lord is. And so the whole section, in a sense, is bracketed in verse 14 and verse 38, bracketed by a, re a reflection on the name, the name of the Lord. Who is this? So, calling on the name of the Lord in verse 14 becomes in verse 38, repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, whom God has appointed both Lord and Christ. That was radical. That was a very radical thing for Peter to say. You need to get your head into what he is saying here. He is taking roles and titles that refer to God, and he is putting them on Jesus. This is offensive. It was offensive to those people now. In order for you and I to understand just how offensive it was to those people, can you even imagine walking into a mosque today and declaring Jesus is Allah? Can you imagine the reaction you would get? Well, Peter would have got a similar reaction from some people in that crowd when he said, Yeshua and Yahweh are the same. Calling on the name of Yeshua, Jesus, is calling on the name of the Lord, Yahweh. Now, that, that really is the background then to this little section that we're looking at this evening. And as he now comes to the good news, it's, we, we just sung about it. It's, it's an old story. and Maybe it's old to you, but I want us to see this evening that it's the same story. It never ages. It should always come to us fresh. It should in, excite our hearts as much today as it did when we first heard the story. I mean, my memory is of my mother singing that song. We just, I didn't pick that song, but, but I remember my mother singing that song to me when I was just a little boy, and I remember 
loving the story then. And I have to tell you that after a very, 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 very long number of years, longer than I care even compute, that story is still as exciting. I don't know if that ever communicated itself to you, but it's still as exciting to me and as wonderful to me as it was, if not more so, now that I'm this great old age that I am. So what I want to do is to talk to you about this great story, this good news that, uh, that the Apostle Peter is proclaiming on that day. Now, here's the interesting thing. This good news that we have as Christians, this gospel that we have as Christians, do you notice that, it, that it's all about a message? It, it's, it's an announcement. What do you do with news? Well, you actually you have to say something if you've got news. People can't just pick it up from your body language. You need to actually tell people what the news is. You've, you've seen something that's good and you want to tell, you have to tell them. You, when, when we turn on the, the television, we want to know what's been happening in, in the city during that, that day. What news is there? Usually it's bad news, but we would really like to hear some good news. But good news isn't always good news for the broadcasters. But we've got good news, and that means that we've got to talk about it. It, in, it implies speech. A lot of the language that you find in Acts is the language of witness, the language of proclamation, the language of announcement. It is, it is absolutely fundamental. What Peter is doing here in the day of Pentecost, full of the Holy Spirit as he is, is telling us that when someone is full of the Holy Spirit, they speak the good news, the gospel. They, they articulate it. They tell it. That's part and parcel of being filled with with the Holy Spirit. Now, let me put it to you like this. The good news of Jesus has to be announced, proclaimed, and explained without the spoken word. Get this. Without the spoken word, people might believe, but they won't necessarily believe in Jesus. Without the spoken word, people may imitate our good practice without imitating our Lord Jesus. Without the spoken word, religious sympathies and fervor may be aroused in people just by being in our worship or by being around us or at some great event, but Christian content and meaning would not be understood. So in order for it to be Christian, there must be a verbal pronouncement, announcement of the good news of Jesus. So Peter is setting a precedent here, and he's saying this is what Christianity is now going to look like. There will be things that happen that get people's attention. There will be good works, for example, and people will ask, why are you doing these good works? There will be works of charity or compassion. There may be even more spectacular things take place, but they will all require at the end of the day knowing the good news, the message. Now, here's the problem. I forgot to look when I started. You should worry about that. Well, let's focus in on the message. Very, very straightforward. Peter has one word. That's really what his message sums up as. One word, Jesus. That's his message. The good news is all about Jesus. In all of this good news message that he preaches, he doesn't see anything about your morality. He doesn't see anything about your behavior. He doesn't see anything about any rules that you're to keep. He doesn't see anything about about you at all. He says nothing about you. He tells you about Jesus. That's what the gospel is. It's a testimony, not about me and my experience, but about Him. And he starts with Jesus' credentials. He talks about Jesus' death. He speaks about Jesus' vindication. And then he talks about His exaltation to the place of all power in the cosmos. This is Peter's summary of the core of Christian teaching. Walk through it with me for a moment. First of all, he calls attention to Jesus' credentials. And he starts where he is. This, is, this happened on a particular day and was spoken to a particular people at a particular time. Men, Israelites, he says. And he immediately He doesn't even soften them up. He immediately goes on to offend them. Jesus of Nazareth. 
Well, nobody wanted really to talk about Jesus right then and there. After all, they just killed the man, and of course, he'd aroused all kinds of mixed reactions in the crowd. We know that. We know that from the story of the gospel. But Peter isn't there just simply to stroke people's ego. He is there to announce the good news. Men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. And he reminds them of what they know. These people know this about Jesus. You and I are not in this crowd. They were there, and he says, This Jesus of Nazareth is a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. You know the story. You either know firsthand because you yourself were touched by him, or you know somebody. It's not a massive population in Palestine. Jesus has been wandering around for three years healing people every day, hundreds of them at a time. Everybody knew somebody who'd been healed by Jesus. Everybody knew somebody who'd been among the crowds that were fed by that miraculous food. Everybody knew somebody who knew somebody who was there when Jesus was raised from the dead, these people from Jerusalem. Many of them, many of them knew this well-connected family of Lazarus and Mary and Martha who lived in Bethany two miles from Jerusalem. I live two miles from here. I walk to work every day. It was a short walk to where uh, Mary and... uh, Martha and Lazarus lived, many of, and there was a well-connected family, and many of the people who he's talking to in this crowd in Jerusalem knew that family, and either they themselves or someone they knew was there the day that Lazarus, who was dead, was made alive again and came out of the tomb all wrapped up in bandages and wondering what was going on. A man attested to you by the supernatural phenomena that surrounded him in his public life. There were the miracles, the mighty works that indicated God's power at work through him. There were the wonders, things that provoked amazement in the crowds and in the witnesses who saw them. And these were all signs, he says, that pointed beyond themselves, pointed to the character of Jesus and the significance of Jesus coming into the world. And he says, God did through him in your midst all of these things as you yourselves know. Nobody said, no, we don't know about this. This is the first time we've heard about this. What are you talking about? We never heard about this before. He's talking to these people about credentials Jesus had of which they were themselves witnesses. That's important as we start off this evening that we recognize in the language of Luke himself again in chapter 24 of his gospel that Jesus was a prophet in the eyes of many, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Jesus' credentials were impeccable. Jesus' credentials were amazing. And above all, and here's the key, Jesus' credentials were matters of public knowledge. They took place in the public space. Nothing was done privately. It was done publicly before crowds. Jesus' credentials. But then he focuses, he moves on to focus on Jesus' death. This was the problem, wasn't it? This was the stumbling block. It would remain a stumbling block to the Jews. And uh, he describes this, the death of Jesus, in terms of his being handed over, delivered up. This Jesus, delivered up, he says, handed over, was crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This remained a problem for Jews. It's a problem for Muslims today who deny that he was killed still for their own reasons. They deny that he was killed because if uh, he was killed, then his resurrection was real, and that immediately means that he is greater than any prophet. Therefore, it would undo their religion. So, they deny his death. But they, these people knew he was dead. Romans, Romans were clever people. They knew how to kill people, and they'd kill Jesus. They, uh, there was no way around that particular fact. So, he announces the death of Jesus, and he then goes on to explain the death of Jesus. He puts it in perspective. He uses language about the decree of God, for example. This Jesus delivered up by 
or according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. He puts it, he puts it in its eternal context. He says this was no accident. This was no mistake. This was no surprise to God. This was part of God's decree. In fact, the word he uses is a word that's used in the Greek translation of Psalm 2, verse 7. He puts the death of Jesus in perspective. Now, just for a pause for a moment, I'm going to give you this next, next little bit is just free. I'm just throwing it in totally free and for nothing as a little, uh, a little extra. I, I think it's important as we read what he says about the death of Jesus here um, to see that, that he places the responsibility for the death of Jesus in two places. Do you notice in the text? He says that it was part of the plan and purpose of God and that the people who did it, including these people who are listening to him at this moment, are responsible for the death of Jesus. These two things, the sovereignty of God on the one hand and the responsibility of the people on the other. Now, how do you weld those two things together? How do you deal with that? And there's a philosophical principle called concurrence that helps us to understand what is going on here. It's quite critical to understand the providence of God. One of the words we use about the good government of God, the way He overrules our lives, as well as what's going on in this text. The Westminster Confession of Faith, our confession captures this very well when it says, God from all eternity did, by the most wise and holy counsel of His own will, freely and unchangeably ordain what it whatsoever comes to pass. So what is it saying? It's saying the first part of our text here, that everything that happens, everything big and small, great uh, and, and insignificant, happens according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. But the confession goes on to say this, this foreordination is not carried out in such a way as to eliminate secondary causes or do violence to the will of the creature. Now, what does that mean? That means that God brings His will to pass. He does His will uh, and works in and through and by the real decisions of real people. He doesn't make them make the decisions. They make their own decisions. He doesn't twist their arm to do something. He lets them make that decision and make that choice by themselves. They do the choosing. They do the willing. God works through and by their chosen will to accomplish His ultimate purpose. Uh, In Genesis 50, verse 20, remember Joseph? You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. So here we have these two principles. They work together in concurrence so that the sovereign work of God cannot be used as an excuse by us that somehow or other we're not responsible for our behavior. Peter is speaking to these people gathered before them there, and he says, you know, this Jesus was delivered up according to God's great plan, but you crucified and killed Him. You did. Now, interesting, just a little Another little extra here. Later on in Acts, when Peter is speaking to another group of Jews, he describes the fact that Jesus was delivered up by God into the hands of wicked men and killed, but he changes his language there. He's talking to people who were not in Jerusalem there, and he doesn't accuse them of being guilty of what the people in Jerusalem were guilty of. That's important. You can't blame all Jews for the death of Jesus. You can only blame the Jews that were responsible for the death of Jesus, the ones in Jerusalem. That's an important principle which the church needs to remember and which humanity needs to remember. And all this business about apologizing for things that happened hundreds of years ago that we weren't responsible for is a load of old nonsense, to use a phrase from Shakespeare. Not really, but it sounds better if you say it was from Shakespeare. (laughs) So here you have his credentials. Here you have his talk about the death of Jesus. And uh, thirdly, he then moves on to talk about 
the resurrection. This is his main point, the the resurrection or the vindication, we would want to call it, the vindication of Jesus. So here's here's the process. Jesus, credentialed among you by the things that he did, delivered by you, Jews, into the hands of wicked men, the Romans, condemned by every earthly court, Herods, Pilots, the Sanhedrin, condemned, condemned, condemned by every earthly court, killed. But the verdict of the courts is overturned by the supreme court of the universe as the heavenly judge responds to the greatest injustice of all by raising Jesus from the dead. That's Peter's announcement. And it's absolutely fundamental to the gospel itself. Let me read how he puts it. This Jesus, killed by the hands of lawless men, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was impossible for them to hold him. Now that phrase, loosing the pangs of death, we're going to do a little bit of close work here, comes from Psalm 18, verse 4. It's a mixed metaphor in which death is regarded as being in labor and unable to hold back its child. It's a a, a strange uh, metaphor, but but that's what it says. It's God brought the pangs to an end so that the birth is to bring Christ to light. Christ is brought out of death, brought into life and liberty and light. And he says it was impossible for the son of David to be prevented by death from exercising his eternal kingly rule quotes from Psalm 18 and uses it as a way of explaining the meaning of Psalm 16, which he's about to cite more fully. And the implication is Jesus was resurrected because he already was the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God. Now, just as he had used the prophecy of Joel earlier, he now turns to Psalm 16 to prove the resurrection Uh, Not not so much to prove the resurrection as a historical event. That's what he was there for. The prophets were there for it. They were the the witnesses to Jesus being alive. But in order to show that, resurrection was part of the package of what it meant to be the Jews' Messiah. So he takes them to that psalm, that psalm which was written by David about a life lived under the rule of God in which there is protection mentioned in uh, verse 8 of the psalm, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And David, as he writes the psalm, rejoices uh, or reaches beyond his present circumstances to include the hope that he will always be with God. He says, I'm with God now, and I'm always going to be with God. There'll never be a time when I'm not in the presence of God. And he begins to work this out. This has an effect on the way he looks at death. And he says, death no longer terrifies me because you will not abandon me in the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. And so his confidence is in the impotence of death to destroy his personal relationship with God. Since God has already led him in the paths of life, He anticipates that God will be able to fill him with joy in his presence. Now, this last clause comes from Psalm 16, verse 11, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And I think that's where he gets the idea of the right hand, and he's going to use that later in his sermon. But the implications of Jesus' presence at God's right hand are that God has bodily raised Jesus from the dead. Now, look how he he argues it. We're going to do a bit of close work in this text because it's easy just to glide over these words. First of all, he says, David said this, but David is dead and buried and his tomb is here. You can visit Muhammad's tomb. You can visit David's tomb. You can visit any of these tombs because the people in them were totally dead. They're still dead, physically dead. So when... David talks about the, uses this kind of language. He can only be talking about some form of resurrection. So what is he, what is he talking about? Is David disturbed mentally when he talks about his own resurrection? And yet there he is. He's dead, buried, and in his tomb. 
Well, here's his second point. David was a prophet, he says. He was a prophet. And uh, Jesus himself had, uh, d- had suggested the prophetic status of David when, he inter- re- when Jesus interpreted Psalm 110. <clears throat> but here in, in, ch- in, chapter, in Psalm 16, David, we're told, knew that God had promised him on a north that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. So the question is, if David was a prophet, how would God's covenant with David be maintained into the future? Peter's answer, David could see what was to come. And speaking about the resurrection of the Messiah, he then goes on, here's the third point, that only through resurrection from the dead could a son of David hope to rule forever over God's people. That's the only way it could happen. A son of David could only rule forever if somehow or other he never died, or if he died, he was raised again to resurrection life. That's the argument that he makes. The Holy One is saved from death in his body. You will not let his body see corruption. It's his body, not just that the spirit of this man goes on as the spirit of David goes on in the presence of God, but the body of this Holy One will be raised. Peter says this is a reference to the Messianic son of David. David is a recipient and conveyor of God's ancient but ever-renewed promise of resurrection for the Messiah. And then the fourth point that Peter makes about Jesus concerns the next point that we're going to look at which is not only that Jesus is raised from the dead, that's, that's the high point of his message. Without resurrection, there's no Christianity. Paul made that very clear when he said, I deliver to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Kephas and then to the Twelve. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. If, you, if you're really serious about trying to discover what Christianity is about, you need, you need to read up about the resurrection of Jesus. You need to investigate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have not given Christianity a chance to make its point until you've given yourself to investigating the resurrection. That is the vindication of Jesus. Without that, there is no Christianity. Paul's very straightforward. The Apostle Paul in the Bible is very straightforward. He's writing to people in a pagan environment like the environment we live in here, and he says to these people, look, if Jesus was not raised bodily from the grave, we've been kidding ourselves. We really are the most foolish people. We are to be most pitied of all the people in the world. We have been kidding ourselves on. You better not have anything to do with us. That's what we would say to you. Jesus is not alive. There is nothing, nothing in this, nothing in this at all. But if Jesus is alive, then that's the vindication of everything. But it's not only that Jesus is alive. Here's his fourth point. God has raised him. He's been exalted. You see, that's what Peter talks about here as he quotes again from these Old Testament passages in the Psalms, and he says Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God. That's the proper place for the Messiah to be. It's a place of all power. And from that place, and here, here, David, here Peter blends together two great ideas in the Bible, the teaching about David on the one hand and the teaching of Moses on the other. He blends these together. He sees all of these theologies coming together in the person of the Lord Jesus. And he says, the Lord Jesus has from his exalted place at the right hand of God done what you see today. You think this is a miracle, he says to these people. You were here. You saw these people speak your, you heard them speak your language. Not only your language, but your dialect from your area. You think that can be done normally under normal circumstances? These are just ordinary people. Some of these people are from Galilee. In Galilee, you're lucky if you can say your name. I come from a part of Scotland called Lanarkshire. 
Let me t- there's such a th- thing as Lanarkshire Man, which my mother tried to draw me out of. She didn't want me to be one of them. And um, she just about succeeded. But, but Lanarkshire Man can hardly put two words together without other words in between that you don't want to hear. Well, the people from Galilee, they had a reputation for being like that, you see. And he's saying, this is a miracle, isn't it? You, you have to say, this is something quite remarkable that's occurred. What I want to say to you, says Peter, is Jesus from his exalted throne has done what the Scriptures said would happen. He's poured out his Spirit on all flesh so that everybody could hear in their own language the wonderful works of God. This Pentecost event is a once-for-all thing. It's a unique thing. It happened to these people that day who are listening to Peter at this moment. Peter says, Jesus has done this from his throne. David never ascended to the right hand of God, but Messiah has. Jesus is the Lord of the Spirit. He is the Lord of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God does what He commands Him to do. He has sent the Spirit of God. Who has control of the Spirit of God? Who can manage to capture the Spirit of God? How can you capture the wind of God, the Spirit of God? A human being could never do that, but God can do that. And so, he says, coming to the climax of his sermon, let all Israel, he'd started talking to all Israel. Now he's talking to all Israel again. Let all the house of Israel know this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved from the final judgment that's coming in the end of the day of the Lord. Which Lord should you call on? There's only one Lord. God raised this Jesus of which we're all witnesses. Call on the name of that Lord and you will be saved from wrath through Him. This is Peter's message. And in his message, what what he's doing, do you see, is he's teaching them basic Christianity. You, You can't get any closer to the essentials than this, Jesus' credentials as a man, Jesus' death with all its injustice, Jesus' vindication by being raised from the dead, Jesus' exaltation to the place of all power and glory. I want to say to you tonight, if you're not a Christian, this is it. This is the core, the kernel. This is the genius of the Christian message. It's right at the very heart, simple. It's about one person. It's not about you. It's not about us. It's not about the church. It's about Jesus. I ask you to consider Him. I ask you to think about Him. I ask you to investigate His claims. To ask yourself whether these men who gave their witness that first Pentecost are credible witnesses. And if they are, you really only have one choice. If He is who He said He is, then the day of the Lord is something to be feared. But isn't it wonderful that this day is being held back, judgment held back? So you could hear tonight the good news. Call on the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we have such good news to announce to people. Not the, uh, not the issuing of a law, but the announcement of the gospel. We pray that today everyone in this room would embrace it for themselves. In Jesus' strong name, amen.